My guest this week is Martin Ball. This is a fun conversation you're about to hear, um, and primarily for me at least because Martin and I have differing uh, points of perspective on a lot of different things. And I think if you dig Martin and of his work, where there is on this uh, podcast page, an actual podcast episode, um, you'll you'll see that we have some differing viewpoints. Although there are a lot of viewpoints that I think ultimately are are quite similar. Um, so you'll hear a kind of a healthy debate about. Uh, the nature of reality, non-duality, what's objectively real, what's subjectively real, what's tangibly real, um, the usefulness of kind of religious or ritualistic or magical or spiritual modalities um, I'm advocating for, as you can imagine, um, versus they're just not being necessary and potentially harmful. So there's a really nice debate that goes through. I think it's like halfway through. I know it's kind of a long one, but it's interesting uh, for me <laughs> at least to have these types of conversations, not because I'm trying to convince anyone of anything, but to flesh out my own beliefs and royalties that may be uh, in, enmeshed in something that I can just take for granted and to get them out in words is always not, it's pretty fun. Sometimes it's a fun thing to do. So that's what happens in this episode. Um, is there anything else I need to say? Go check out Martin. He's got a conference going on in Oregon, Ashland, Oregon, called Exploring Psychedelics. Um, sounds pretty cool. He's got some cool people going. Um, definitely check him out. See if you vibe with him. Uh, big thanks to Rianne who, who, who recommended who, who, who. Who who recommended Martin? Um, like I said, I enjoy disagree with people. <laughs> is that is that fun? No, it's a good way to work out your own kind of beliefs. Like I said, so that's this episode. Do I have anything else to tell you? Yeah, crypto sync. Uh, if you want to join crypto sync, this is not a bad time to get involved in cryptocurrency. I know you could say that theoretically at any point when when things are going like they are. Um, but uh, spring summer, not so bad. I'm doing a special offer. I wrote something on Facebook that I just shared with the Synchronicity community via email and the CryptoSync community that kind of gave a background picture of uh, what was going on with me uh, in 2016 and why I'm such a cryptocurrency evangelical. And it's not really um, so much that I love making money or being financially secure and that's the best thing in life and oh my god that's what you got to do it's that a lot of the things that i talk about in this show um, are incredibly effective modalities for kind of altering your consciousness in a positive direction you know being more grateful being more compassionate being more understanding trying to find things to help you with whatever your particular issues are but i i've met enough people in life and experienced it myself where if you don't have some sense of stability um, and truthfully just operating space, whether, and, and it, it doesn't matter what that's brought on by, but often if you don't have that financially, all this shit is really hard. Like it's, it's especially hard. Let me put it this way. Let's say you've never worried about money, so you're not going to give a shit about cryptocurrency probably anyway, but if you've never had to worry about money, um, think how hard it is sometimes to meditate or do a healing practice and think of how much your ego and other things can be involved. And you pretty much like don't have to worry about a thing that a lot of other people to worry about. I'm probably not speaking to that many of you. So you, if you are not in that group and you do have certain financial concerns, you know how much time that takes up. And for me, what kind of opened up an aspect of, a, of my life is recognizing that, no, this isn't a get rich quick scheme. No, you're not going to be a millionaire overnight and make $10 into $100,000. But something is clearly happening in the space. It's not all smoke and mirrors. It's not all Ponzi schemes. And drilling down and trying to understand this, um, I think, has paid dividends not only financially for people, but just learning more about the nature of reality. I know that sounds weird, but people in crypto say, and I also say this, let's say you're listening and you just don't have any money, that you just have nothing. But you want to, you want send me an email, noah at syncpodcast.com, 
And, and I'll offer something out. I also offer free resources on YouTube related to this stuff. I don't want this to be exclusionary. Um, I do want the community to be gated in the sense that I want serious people in there. I don't want riffraff coming in because the gates are completely open and they can just start spewing opinions back and forth. We really cultivated a really nice group of people in there. So I know this sounds like an extended ad, but I did want to point it out. It's still absolutely a part of my life. And even though I don't talk about it on the podcast that much anymore, um, I'd lying if I said it wasn't integrated in any way. So anyway, we're going to get to this episode now. Big thanks to Patrick Nemchek for Patreon, patron music. It's May. You guys daycare full time. God willing, he doesn't get sick anytime soon. I'll have full time to work on the podcast and other things, music such as that. All right. Getting to the episode, big thanks to Martin. Without further ado, here is Martin Ball. Cool. So with that said, thank you for coming on again. I think a cool place to start would maybe be, could you, let me ask you this, before you did 5-MeO DMT, were you a psychonaut? I mean, I imagine that's, there has to be some precursor, whether it's psilocybin or LSD before just jumping in, or was that your first experience ever? It definitely was not my first yeah. experience. <laughs> it's like, that would be a crazy yeah. person. Okay. So I think the reason I asked that question is because it seems to me, and you can tell the story, it seems like there was a profound shift when you did 5-MeO-DMT yes. relative to these other ones you've done. And these shifts, I think it's really important to say, you know, and people who are familiar with this show will know this, it's not like 5-MeO-DMT is the panacea, this is the one you have to do and then you'll get it. These experiences can be brought about in many different ways, as you know, as a comparative, you know, religion analyzer here, you know, these things can be brought on by anything. But I'd love some perspective about kind of your life before 5-MeO-DMT and how you would kind of synthesize your current perspective. Because I imagine there's people listening who have not had a revelatory experience, whether brought on by 5-MeO-DMT or otherwise. So any perspective there, I think, would be a cool place to start. Okay. Well, first, I'll answer that by saying it's a relatively long story. Cool. And... um. After I went through this event, and well, not just an event, but a process that was really initiated with 5-MeO-DMT, and then I started speaking publicly about what I had learned and kind of the development of my own view of the nature of being, the nature of God, the nature of reality, that I went through several years where people kept asking me, how did you learn this? You know, even people who had had 5-MeO-DMT, they're like, well, still, how, how did you develop this perspective that you're now sharing. And I ended up answering that question so many hundreds of times. I mean, literally by people coming over to my house and like, just, I just want to talk to you and I want to figure, <laughs> figure out how you figured this out, how you learn this about yourself. So I eventually wrote it all into a book. So the short answer <laughs> is my book, Being Infinite, an Entheogenic Odyssey into the Limitless Eternal, a memoir from ayahuasca to Zen. Um, really tells the whole story awesome. about what that is. And it's, it's significant that I reference that, that there is a whole story because for anyone who works with entheogens or anyone who's, you know, working on a meditation program or something like that, when they finally do have the, the big break breakthrough, there's often that feeling of like, oh shit, every moment of my life has been leading up to this right here and you get this you start to see that how your own story unfolded and how you were confusing yourself and also leading yourself in the right direction at the same time totally. um so that personal side of it i do think is very important and so then i wrote the book being infinite so that when people ask me that question i could say here's the book <laughs> but so but not to short circuit the interview in any yeah. way I, I do want to say that it is it's a detailed story and it takes a long time to really tell the whole story um so i'll give you the the condensed version yeah. here uh the condensed version is that when it comes to mind-altering substances when i was a high school student i got really drunk once and threw up and was hung over and thought 
this is like the worst possible thing. I have zero interest in doing this at all. And it made me just feel stupid and sloppy. I mean, literally, you know, I was out, we were drinking rum and Coke or something with some friends and we were out at this park and I couldn't walk back to the car. So I'm crawling across this big field <laughs> and my friend is kind of wa- this is like walking his dog, right? And my friend's walking alongside me. And I was like, oh man, I love you so much. You're such a good friend. <laughs> I'm throwing up everywhere. And, you know, I get home and my, my older sister um, was asleep in, in her room. And I literally had to crawl into her room. And I'm like waking her. I was like, Jessica, is my sister's name. I was like, Jessica, Jessica, I need help. I'm, throw, I'm throwing up. And she went and she got buckets for me to throw up in. And she cleaned it all up. And she hid it from my parents. And so I was like, it's like one of the nicest things my sister's ever done for me. <laughs> um, but I decided right then and there, it's like, okay, drinking alcohol, I have zero interest in drinking alcohol. And at some point after that, um, some older kids at, at school were like, hey, you want a hit of this? And um, no, actually, no, no. It was actually my cousin. I remember now. It was, it was my cousin. It's usually came... fam- very close to the family, I found. Yeah, yeah. It's all, it's all, I blame my family. It's my, <laughs> my older cousin was actually the first person who smoked me out with marijuana. And it was either my 14th or 15th birthday. Um, yeah. I'm not certain which one it was. I think it was my 15th birthday. And that, for me, that was just like a revelation. It was just like, this is amazing. Um you know, we were just watching TV at the time, but I was like, whoa, this is the greatest thing ever. And found that, um, you know, at this time I was also a buddy musician and yeah, there was an older kid in school that I was playing guitar with and he's like, well, we're musicians. And so, and artists, and it's our duty to get high (laughs) and share our artistic revelations with the world. And I was like, yeah, okay. I like that. So anyway, for me, cannabis use really tied in with things that I wanted to do, like going out hiking, making music, making art, writing gothic poetry. You know, I was, I was all into the whole goth scene as a teenager. Um, so that kind of started me on the path of like altered states, um, was cannabis. And then later on, um, in college, I was a philosophy major, religious studies minor. And I had people saying, you really got to it was actually my girlfriend at the time. She's like, well, you've really got to try psilocybin mushrooms, <laughs> given that you're interested in all this stuff. So, yeah, I started with psilocybin mushrooms at uh, a festival, a summer festival. I have no idea how much I took or anything like that. Um, but I got separated from my friends. It was kind of a classic case <laughs> yeah, of yeah. taking psychedelics at a festival. And this was the first quote unquote festival I'd ever been to at the time. <laughs> they're not and this so was, just like they're all like this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was something else because it was out in the middle of nowhere in rural California on a river. It was called Gathering of the Vibes. Yeah. And you know, I mean keep in mind, okay, keep in mind that personally as an as a person, as an individual, I was like the nerd. Okay. I was like the semi cool nerd. No, not, not, not like really cool, but you know, like <laughs> semi cool nerd where, um, I was all just about academics, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I didn't, I didn't party. I didn't, um, engage in quote unquote, the counterculture or whatever you might want to call it. So I went to this festival and it just blew my mind because there was naked people everywhere. And I was like, whoa, shit. I, you know, I thought this stuff ha- happened in the 60s. It was long gone. But, you know, there's all these naked people and there's all this open drug use. And there's people having sex in public. And I'm like, wow, what is this? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that was my first mushroom experience was at this festival. And I got separated from my friends. And then like, oh, I'm kind of paranoid. And I felt like I could look through everyone. Like I could, I could just look at people and like see what was going on with them. And then that was just kind of freaky and weird. Yeah. Then finally, I found my friends and sat down and then enjoyed the show. There was like a concert going on and, <laughs> you know, and that was great. So that was my first mushroom experience. Um, and mostly from that, I was just kind of curious because I was like, well, it was really weird. I'm not sure what the appeal is because it was so weird and kind of just disorienting. But I thought, well, I, I want to get back into this. So I started exploring that more. And for a number of years, um, it was just cannabis and psilocybin mushrooms is, is really all my experience was. Plus, you know, I 
had sort of become a Zen Buddhist and was practicing meditation. And then sometimes I like to combine all three together. Sure. Um, and those are some very, like the first time I smoked marijuana and then meditated. I can't do it. It was, for me, it was just like crazy. It was like, at the time, I described it as an out-of-body experience. That is now a term that I have set aside. I don't really like that term yeah, yeah. For, for various reasons. Um, but anyway, that got, because of my experiences, that got me interested in trying to read as much as I could about the use of psychedelics in traditional cultures. You know, I got into Carlos Castaneda, got into Terrence McKenna, got into um, all the ethnobotany that I could find. And, and so this was uh, while I was a graduate student. Um, and then I like to tell the story. And so I was in Los Angeles, uh, excuse me, I was in Santa Barbara. Uh, I was an undergraduate in Los Angeles and a graduate student in Santa Barbara. And one day I got the LA times. That was like my newspaper. That's what I'd like to read in the morning. And there was an article about this plant called salvia divinorum, which I'd, I'd seen mentioned, you know, in some of the anthropological literature that I'd read, but there, there was this article about this guy, Daniel Siebert and how he was selling salvia divinorum on the internet and he just lived down in santa monica and the la times provided his website i was like well i'll give that a try <laughs> so i ended up ordering some salvia divinorum some enhanced leaf salvia yes, divinorum. i remember that that stuff was really popular back in the day and i i i i have a weird story with salvia not to cut you off but when i was okay. doing it back in the late 90s um, I was in a circle of people. We were, you know, using the blowtorch to get it and using like a bong or something. Nothing for me. I was just like, ah, eh, this is nothing. The guy next to me totally lost his shit. I mean, like com completely yeah. was gone. Person next to him, she went, she said she was in India in a purple sari. And I was like, what the fuck? So it's always been something. And again, my stepdad, not to reference him too much, also a big salvia person, big, big into that and, and extols its virtues in many ways. Continue. Yeah. Well, apparently something like 10% of people have zero reaction to yeah. salvia. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you're you're part of the 10%. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. but for most people, yeah. it is it is by far the weirdest psychedelic that's available out there. Yeah, I've heard that. Because it because it's it's completely unlike anything else. So I started working a lot with salvia. And it's also one of these things where uh, often people who try it they're either i am never touching that thing again <laughs> yeah. or i got it whoa do it. Yeah. when can when can i do that again that was amazing um so there, there's there's like no middle ground with salvia divinorum yeah, yeah. people either really like it or they just want to stay the hell away from it because it's so different and unique i was one of those people that's like this is awesome <laughs> i love this um so then to kind of fast forward the story um after I finished graduate school, things did not go well for me in terms of trying to find a job. I kind of felt that I was just going to, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person that went from high school directly to college, directly from college to graduate school. And the plan was then to go become a professor and start teaching religion, religious studies. And uh, this is all detailed in the book. It's a quite an interesting story, but th that did not work out. And I won't get into those details. <laughs> um, so I ended up actually having a lot of time on my hands. And what that meant was I started reading novels again for like the first time since I was a teenager, that everything had been academic, yeah, academic, yeah. academic. And so I went and I read um, the whole Dune series, which I had started <laughs> as a teenager but never finished, and also went in and read all the Lord of the Rings and Cimmerillion and The Hobbit. You know, I read all these books. And when I, when I finished... Lord of the Rings. Um, it was it was literally it was a Tuesday night. I was a temporary professor. I was a lecturer at UC Berkeley, and it was like ten o'clock at night on a Tuesday. And I just decided right then and there. I said, "Well, you know what? I'm going to write my own science fiction fantasy epic. That's what I want to do because I, you know, I've just had this temporary job at UC Berkeley. I'm going to go back to teaching English in Santa Barbara." And that's a really boring job and <laughs> totally not engaging my intellect in any way, shape, or form. So I'm just going to write my own epic science fiction fantasy series. <laughs> awesome. And that began um, my series, Tales of Arduin, which is a four-book series 
um, which almost no one in the world has ever read. It's just a handful of people have ever read these books. Um, but anyway, I wrote these novels and then after having written it, I realized that everything that I'd really learned from working with Salvia Divinorum and Mushrooms, I'd put into these novels mm. and used it as part, plot developments and character developments and things like that, including some of my own personal experiences. I just gave them to the characters in the stories and mm. I wrote it in there mm. that way. So that inspired me to then write this book, Mushroom Wisdom. And that was the first book that I specifically published about psychedelics. Now, psychedelics were in the novels, but they weren't Explicitly, intended as, you know. Right, right. Yeah. So after writing that book, um, that got picked up really quickly by a publisher, by Ronan Publishing, um, which is really surprising to me. Um, and when the book came out, there was this guy out in the desert in California and he's like, Oh man, I really want your book, but I don't have any money. Can I trade you some stuff for it? I was like, oh, well, okay. You know that the publisher had given me like 25 copies of the book. <laughs> so I sent this guy a copy of the book and he sent me some various things, including some Yopo seeds. Right. So this is where my experience with five MEO DMT began is with Yopo seeds. So these are seeds, um, from, uh, various tree species that grow in central and northern southern america south america yeah. um and these are traditionally roasted and then they're ground up and then they're mixed with stuff and then they, they get you snort them or, or someone actually takes a like a blow gun and like blows them up your nose <laughs> um so i first started trying that and um was not really too taken with the experience that, uh, you know, I've described it as like snorting roasted corn nuts or something <laughs> that, you know, I just like the flavor in my nose. I didn't like, and, and the experience itself is just like the guy who sent them to me said, Oh yeah, it's a nice dreamy experience, you know, last for like 20 minutes or something like that. Give it a try. So I gave it a try and it was kind of like, ah, uh, so what, especially after having worked for so many years with Salvia right, Divinorum, right. which I was used to just like, Bam. Right. And so that, you know, wasn't such a big deal to me. Um, but then anyway, uh, events transpired at Burning Man in the year of 2007, where for the first time in many years, so I had been married, I had two kids at the time. Um, my son was just five months old but had been very, very unhappy in that relationship mm -hmm. personally for about a decade at right. that point, but had never had the strength of heart or character to do anything about it. Mm. Um, basically I had wanted to end that relationship and just, there was a whole variety of reasons that I held myself back from doing so. But then events transpired at Burning Man in 2007 where it just, I literally made the decision at Burning Man that not only was I going to listen to my heart, which I had been ignoring up until that point, but that I was going to follow my heart and that I was going to be true to myself. And this choice really was the turning point for me personally. Because then a week after that, having gotten back home from Burning Man, and when my wife said, I just get the feeling that you're going to leave, I said, yes, that's true. <laughs> and um, then that eventually, within a few months, brought me up here to Ashland, Oregon, which is where I am now. Hmm. Um, now, here's the great irony, is that at Burning Man, I had been running a theme camp called The God Box. And the God Box was a really obscure little theme camp. You know, we weren't anything major. We never made the big announcements or anything like that. Um, but at the God Box, I had designed this thing where you'd you'd come in, and first you had to take an oath that you would that you're going to get to go and open the God Box, but you can't tell anybody what's in the God Box. So you had to sign an oath agreeing to that. <laughs> Um, and then you would have to write in the book a confession so that you can say whatever you felt you need to say before you get to open the God box and see what's inside. And then you would go through a, a didgeridoo purification. And then you could go into what we called the lair of the mystic toad and open the God box. And this all came about because I had been searching for um, like a big, I wanted like a big treasure chest or like a big ark 
like some <laughs> big fancy box, right? Yeah, yeah, and that yeah. was going to be the God box. But I ended up just finding um, a mailbox <laughs> and I decorated it and I put eyeballs on it and these big green feet. And, and once I made that, I was like, yeah, it's like a mystic toad. <laughs> so the God box was also the lair of the mystic toad and the, and the mystic toad and the God box were one and the same thing. Okay. And so then you go in, you go through this whole process and you, you crawl into the lair of the mystic toad and you open up the mailbox and then inside was a mirror. Cool. You say, ah, it's me. And I started this kind of as, as a joke at Burning Man that I thought, ha, oh, this would be kind of funny. This will be fun. And the first year that we did it, people were coming out crying and there's like, that was the most profound experience of my <laughs> life. And it, and, it, and it surprised me and my other campmates were like, whoa, I think we're doing something here. We don't, we don't know what we're doing. Yeah, this is really yeah, affecting guess, people. Yeah. So anyway, to keep the story going, after I moved to Ashland, I moved up here with no job, no prospects, no idea what in the hell I was doing. I was just doing that whole follow your heart thing. <laughs> and I ended up applying for a job at a local record company that doesn't exist here anymore. Um, but the guy who received my application for that went and he checked out my personal webpage, martinball.net. And then he ended up calling me. He's like, dude, I can't offer you the job because you're not right for the job. You're, you're way too educated. We just need some snot-nosed kid to do this shit. And he said, but, well, what, what kind of mystic toad do you have there? And, you know, it's like, it's a mailbox. It's like, oh, okay. He said, well, I have the real thing. Would you like to come over and try it? <laughs> okay. I, I don't know who this guy is. Okay. But at this point, I, I had... I knew that there was this toad, this Sonoran desert toad, Bufo alvarius, the only toad in the world whose secretions produce 5-MeO-DMT. And um, this guy said, yeah, man, it's a rocket ship straight into the heart of God. And it's like, well, okay. <laughs> you know, I, I had experience with, you know, with, with the Yopo seeds and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so I was like, well, okay, we'll find out about that. So anyway, he invited me over. And we used some toad venom and he had this really weird vaporizer thing. And the thing about toad venom is you need to use an awful lot of it because the percentage of five MEO DMT inside of it is relatively small. Mm. Um, and I definitely didn't get enough. So it really wasn't much beyond my Yopo experiences. It was, so it was kind of like, a, mm, okay, sure. That's great. Um, Nothing mind Salvia well. no right. yeah, Salvia divinorum kicks ass over this thing i mean uh, just in terms of experiential wow factor yeah um so i wasn't impressed by toad venom and i just want to emphasize again that it was it was not enough it was a small amount um and then about a month later this guy invited me over again he's like okay this time i have like a pure plant extract of 5-meo dmt and i've got plenty so come <laughs> on over and, and try it again it's like okay i'll do that so keep in mind, up until this point, I, am, I myself had kind of fashioned myself as sort of a, you know, mushroom shaman kind of guy, sort of Zen Buddhist philosophically, um, somewhat agnostic about the whole question of God, you know, that I, and being trained in philosophy and religious studies, I could talk to you about the empty nature and consciousness and, you know, you had, I could, I could you had sampled from the spiritual buffet in many different yeah. ways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, I kind of viewed the reality as all this, this whole living thing, but I never felt that up until that point, if you had asked me, do you believe in God? I would, you know, I'd give you some kind of wishy washy answer or kind of talk my way around it philosophically mm. or, you know, just say, oh, fuck, I don't know or whatever. Um, and also, you know, having been raised um, secular and then seeing just what I consider to be sort of crazy Christians around me that the whole, even the word God made me uncomfortable. It's sure. like, oh, man, don't use that. Like talk about the universe or something, but don't <laughs> use the word God. <laughs> but anyway, he had this fancy vaporizer that has this glass chamber that was filled with the vapor and argon gas. <laughs> And it's like this little piston. So you, you, as you take your hit, you see the piston move down. And I got about two thirds of the way through the hit. And as I was inhaling, I mean, I can't tell you how rapidly this occurred. Yeah. That I didn't even take the full hit because it was just, oh my 
God, <laughs> it's God. Oh my God. And so I just, the first thing that came out of my mouth as I was exhaling, he was just, thank you, God. <laughs> That's and, God. All right. <laughs> yeah. And for like 40 minutes, I was just lying there just saying, thank you. Thank you. My <laughs> yeah. arms are open and, and, and just ex- from the experiential level, again, as I'm taking the hit, it's like everything, everything in the room is just dissolving into pure white light. And it's like, it's like you're moving through living starlight. It was all conscious. It was all aware. It was all pure love. It was, it was everything. It was the totality of all existence. And after that, okay, after that, if someone were to ask me, do you believe in God? My answer still would have been, no, I don't believe in God. I would say, I know God because God is everything. And so 5-MeO-DMT is rather unique in that as we started off with this conversation, there are many methods for people to experience what now I would refer to this as a non-dual experience, the, the experience where any sense of separation and individuality was completely overwhelmed and overcome. And it was just the totality of everything all at once. And it's one thing. And so that's what I use the word God for is that it's the totality of reality and it's alive. It's aware, it's conscious, it's life and it is love. And after that, I would say, no, I know God because God is the only thing that's real. Everything else is just God playing with itself. Yes through these different forms, but actually there's really only one. And so then that then started a process. (laughs) Yeah, I bet it did. (laughs) My ego trying to grapple with this reality of like, well, what the hell is this? Because then (laughs) see the natural question for anyone to ask after an experience like this is then, well, if God's everything, then who am I? (laughs) Yeah. And the ego has a really, really tough time with that. So this was in very early 2008, like January of 2008. And then in the spring of 2009 is when I finally just cracked. And again, this is all explained in my book, Being Infinite. Um, A lot of details to this story. But at that point, I simply cracked. And then it was like I was tripping 5-MeO-DMT all, all the, time. the time. Okay, cool. I didn't know that. I had happened to me. I just had someone else on the podcast. It was brought on by an LSD experience. It lasted three months for me. And what's interesting about this, everyone who's had this experience, um, I was relatively woo-woo and mystically inclined. However, I started having direct experiences that lasted through waking life and the dream state, and it was continuing. Um, all I could talk about was unconditional love. I'm like a 20 year old kid at music college in Boston. Everyone thinking I'm insane. I'm losing my fucking mind, getting diagnosed as bipolar, go on lithium for a little bit, hit a crash. Basically the hallmarks of this are so regular. They're so almost classifiable where I don't like to put them in a box, like, you know, the American psychological association, but like there's really clear hallmarks of mystical experiences that everyone seems to have. Furthermore, I don't know. And you probably have some experience with this. All my evidence is anecdotal, the frequency, and maybe this is just people speaking about it in a more lucid manner. The frequency of these things seem to be just ramping up at an exponential rate and brought on by many different things. So I'm, I'm fascinated that this seems to be Your particular viewpoint about what supports and is and your direct experience. Let me let me say that Mm -hmm. your direct experience of this is exactly my direct experience. And then you must know this from your studies with religions. This is what was happening to Ramakrishna. This is happening to all the men, the the non dual Advaita Vedanta people. They're talking about this experience very clearly. And then the the irony, as you know. You can't relay the experience. It's an experience. You have it, you're in it, and then you spend potentially the whole rest of this incarnation trying to give people just a taste of it so they can be like, oh, okay, you can go and experience this yourself. It's just, it's a very interesting thing to me that seems to be just kind of emanating from our current, you know, time and place. So yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that there's a, a couple of different reasons for that. Mm. Well, one is that people are at least in the psychedelic world, people are using psychedelics as tools to help them have this experience. And it's 
what's happening in the psychedelic world today is very different than what was happening in the 60s, for example. For Because that was more like my first experience of taking <laughs> mushrooms. I'm right. at a concert. Right. There's naked people, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's not necessarily the right context for having a full non-dual experience. And, that, and <laughs> no shit, yeah. na- now people are looking at, you know, more intentional use. Or, for example, um, also something that, that people are going back to now is like MDMA, where people were like, yeah, I used to take MDMA and I'd go to raves and I'd go to all night dancing and things like that. And now we're seeing how it's a very effective therapeutic tool, but it's not taking MDMA and going out dancing all night. It's taking MDMA and lying down on a couch and going through your shit and experiencing yourself. And so people are using these tools in a different manner where it used to be more for entertainment. Now it is more for personal exploration and growth and resolution of trauma. And 5-MeO DMT also, it, I think it's kind of interesting the history of this because apparently the psychedelic elite from the 1960s and on knew about 5-MeO DMT and yeah. they, and, and this, I mean, I know that this sounds like a conspiracy theory, but, but literally they got together and they made an agreement saying, let's not talk about this. I heard you we, on this with Ralph Metzner, and I mean that's the fucking source. So yeah, <laughs> so the yeah. horse's mouth. Yeah, yeah. Ralph Metzner himself, <laughs> when I when I interviewed him, he said, "Yeah, well, we all knew about it, and we agreed that we weren't going to talk about it because we didn't want it to be made illegal." And 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 that that's really kind of startling for me because you know, I myself. Uh, I am not part of any psychedelic elite in any way, shape, or form. So I haven't had anybody like come and like, well, Martin, we really, really, we need to talk to you about not talking about five MEO or anything like that. And so after my experience, I got on my podcast and I was like, everybody in the world needs to know about this um, because the experience itself is it's more accessible through five MEO DMT than through any other route. Okay, there are many effective methods to having a full non-dual mystical experience. 5-MeO-DMT is simply more effective than anything else. And when, especially when you're looking at um, psychedelic substances, it's just in a class of its own. Mm. It is, I mean, even at the time when I, so this is about 10 years ago, when I first started publicly talking about 5-MeO-DMT, the general public, for the most part, had not really heard about it. And even in psychedelic circles, everybody thought, oh, you mean DMT, right? And I think, no, because they were used to Terrence McKenna and DMT and machine elves yes, and of course. the transcendental object at the end of time in 2012 and all this crap that was being spewed around. And I would have to tell people, no, I'm not talking about NNDMT. That's what Terrence McKenna was talking about. I'm talking about 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, and there is no valid comparison. Okay, 5-MeO-DMT blows DMT out of the water in (laughs) terms of what kind of experiences it makes accessible to the individual. Um, No. Is that yeah. due to the potency alone or the structure of 5-MeO-DMT relative to an NDMT? Well, there's a couple different ways that we can address that question. Um, the energetic power of 5-MeO-DMT is beyond DMT. Okay, so that's that's just one aspect of it. Um, that in, even in terms of dosage, if you want like a full DMT experience, you right. need to use like anywhere from five to ten times the amount of material that you would use of 5-MeO DMT. Right, right. Um, so just at that level, that the dosage levels are much smaller for 5-MeO and the experience is much bigger. Um, also, um, DMT experientially tends to be extraordinarily visual. Very, very visual in nature. And something interesting about the visual nature of DMT is that it almost guarantees that you will be locked into your ego, at least in some capacity. Because as long as there is the one that is seeing and the thing that is seen, Hmm. there's a dualistic sense of separation there. So this is one of the reasons, I mean, Terrence McKenna was very fascinated by DMT and to to use my Terrence McKenna voice, 
It's the one that really makes me hallucinate. (laughs) It's a pretty damn good impression. And and I like to hallucinate. So I smoke DMT and I see these machine elves. (laughs) Okay, so he was enamored with the visionary phenomenon of DMT. And the operative word being he there. He, yes. I get it. That that is dualism, that I am entering into these other realms. And so he used to describe it as the other. He used that word a lot. And he also went referring to psilocybin mushrooms yeah. as the other. Yeah. So these visionary qualities of DMT um, tends to remain at the dualistic level. Okay. By comparison, 5-MeO DMT is not that visual. Um, it, it has visual aspects to it, um, but that's not the predominant feature of the experience. The pro- predominant feature of the experience is the sensation that everything that you thought you are is suddenly dissolving. All sense of boundaries and separation is dissolving, and then it's just this unitary experience. And this is why when I started talking about this, um, I, I said, kind of in contrast to Rick Strassman, I said, well, if, if people want to call DMT the spirit molecule because they think they see spirits and all the rest of this stuff, I'm going to call 5-MeO-DMT the God molecule because this is the one that takes you all the way. Now, also at the neurological level, um, people who have you know been doing neurological work at looking to see where these neurotransmitters are actually operating on our brain Mm. that um, 5-MeO-DMT interacts with the brain in a way that's different from DMT and that it actually overrides the structures, the neurological structures in our brain that are associated with our ego normal sense of consciousness, Mm. whereas DMT actually can even activate those centers of egoic awareness. Mm. Okay, so that we have something differently going on energetically, visually and experientially, they're very different. And then they're also working differently at the neurological level. So they're very, very different from each other. Um, It's much more common when people have a DMT experience to talk about aliens and spirits and elves and other realms and things like that. And it's pretty rare that people have a DMT experience and say, wow, I felt a sense of unity with all things and completely dissolved my ego and was in the pure light and love of God. Um, you know, like in Rick Strassman's book, DMT, the spirit molecule, when, you know, he had all these different subjects that he was giving DMT to only a couple of them had non-dual experiences. Mm. Everybody else had alien weird shit experiences. Right. Whereas with five MEO DMT, the majority of people report having an experience of absolute unity. Okay. Okay. So they're very, very different from each other experientially and really can't just say, well, they're both a form of DMT, so they must be the same because that's just not that, true. That I, I could, it's like saying, you know, MDMA is the same as dexedrine. They're both amphetamines. They're completely different. I, 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 I grok that. So let's, what would be your, let's build a cosmology of these okay. realms, because I this is something that I like to do is is you know get people's perspectives on what's going on. Um, what do you think? Let's talk about DMT and end DMT for a little bit, because I've never done DMT. I've never done ayahuasca. I'm like one of the few people I know in life, outside of my son who's about to be two, who hasn't done ayahuasca or DMT. Um, and one of the reasons I haven't done DMT, and I I have people who regularly will have non dual experiences. They're also very much psychonauts and in not what I would deem consensus reality for the most part. They're they're functioning, of course, but you know, they're they're looking at the world a little bit differently. One of the reasons I've avoided DMT, not in a negative sense, is because the duration of the experience and relative because what I always ask people after they have a psychedelic experience or any transcendental experience brought on by anything is, well, what did you learn? What was the experiences? How did you integrate it in? What is the practical benefit of that experience? And I also recognize that sometimes it can take a decade for the practical benefit to reveal itself. So I don't hold it against them. But it seems like the experience is, is, is very much like you described a sensory kind of not egoic in like a negative sense, but you relating to something yeah. you're somewhere yeah. else, whether it's the astral world, another dimension, these objective real things, whether the psychic projections, what's your take on maybe kind of the spectrum 
of existence and where DMT would fall um, relative to 5-MeO DMT. So 5-MeO DMT, it sounds kind of like, at least to me, kind of like the clear light of awareness in Tibetan Buddhism. Like you are in the fucking void, emptiness, fullness realm. So where do you think, do you think there's an objective reality where in NNDMT those things exist? What do, what's your what's your take on that? Yeah, I like to use the phrase of the divine imagination, mm. that that's mm. what that is. Um, and I really first introduced this concept in my book, Being Human, which was the first book that I wrote after I had my cracking breakthrough. <laughs> as, I, as I, damn, I've got to tell people about this, <laughs> yeah, about yeah. what's going on here. Um, so in Being Human, I, I introduced this concept of the, the divine imagination. And the way that I describe it is that it is your personal interface with the fullness of the imagination of God, the unitary being that is all things, but that it's an interactive mirror interface. In other words, it is reflecting you both as an individual and you as the infinite source of all creativity and imagination that is God but because it's mostly not dissolving the ego that you're still interacting with it as a form of character Mm -hmm. and therefore it very prone to misrecognition that when you see these things, you say, Whoa, that's the weirdest damn thing I've ever seen. What is that? But see, when you understand from the non-dual perspective that, Oh, well I am God that my imagination, not my personal imagination, which I'm mostly inhabiting as an individual, (laughs) but my imagination as God is limitless and is filled with all kinds of fantastic, amazing, incredible things that seem to be able to access other areas of space and time and being and all this weird stuff. But this is where I, I like to personalize and say, well, it's all you, okay? It's not you as the you that you think that you are. It's the fullness of you. It's, that's why it's the divine imagination. It's not the personal imagination. So there's things in there that may seem transcendental or archetypal or coming from other cultures and other places and other times. But since you are God and you are all things, these things are all you. And it's, it can be kind of freaky if you're in that state where it's very dualistic, but then you can recognize that it's yourself. I mean, one of the ways I talk about it is, is imagine that you've never actually seen yourself in a mirror before. And this is hard for people to imagine because we've all grown up in cultures where we have mirrors. But keep in mind that, you know, for most of human history, there weren't mirrors. And then at some point, somebody invented a mirror and then it's like, oh, shit, that's me. But just imagine you've lived your entire life and you're an adult now, but you've never seen your reflection and you've never seen someone draw a picture of you. You've never had your portrait taken. You've never had a photograph. So you don't actually know what you look like. The first time you see yourself in the mirror, it'd be like, whoa, who's that? What is that? (laughs) It's like any time on psychedelics, if you look in the mirror, you're like, exactly. You're like, whoa, who is that over there? And then, (laughs) and then suddenly it dawns on you. like, shit, that's me. And then it starts changing. And and then you're like, oh shit, none of this is real. Fuck. (laughs) Right. And then, you know, it brings home the question of the, well, then who am I? Right. Who am I really? So it's a reflection in the divine imagination. And it is not objectively real. It is something that is experientially created through these feedback loops in the moment. Mm-hmm. So if someone says, oh, yeah, it was this really real experience of this giant mantis-like deity. Okay, that giant mantis-like deity does not exist out there somewhere. Mm. It's created in the interface in the moment. So for example, one of the places that um, this is one of the things people don't like about what I have to say, um, you know, is that I've critiqued Rick Strassman in his book with DMT, the spirit molecule, where he says, well, DMT um, possibly gives you access to what he called channel dark matter. And mm-hmm. that, that he started treating these as objective experiences. And so now you'll see mm-hmm. people posting online about how scientists say that DMT gives you access to alien civilizations and other realms. And I am emphatic that is fallacious. Mm. That is not correct. These are merely reflections of yourself in that moment. And if you think that they're real, 
you're deluding yourself and you're creating a narrative All right, let me, around your experience. This, is, this yeah. is very interesting. Let me ask you this. Would you say that they're unreal in the same way that we are unreal, Martin and Noah? Or would you say that we have some more concrete reality than those non-objective things? Oh, we definitely have more concrete reality than those because those are those are ephemeral. Those are just experiences that are happening in the moment, whereas we are energetically grounded into physical bodies that have continuity and coherence over time. Mm. Whereas, I see, uh, yeah, I I think I agree with you to some extent, but I do believe that these archetypal whatever realms we want to refer to them as are objectively real as well, but in the same way that I don't think that this human world is all that real either. I, I here's, and, and I'm sure you can relate to this. When you pierce the veil of this world, not on psychedelics, when you're not under the influence of any mind altering substance um, and shit happens, whether it's synchronicities, whether it's just these magical, whatever word you want to use that, no, this is not how consensus reality was. We were told it works. To me, what that feels like is that, yes, humanity, we are we are clearly, I do believe this, given a very precious birth, if you believe in the reincarnation and cyclical existence as humans, because we have this reflective ability, we have this ability to potentially you know, see other worlds. But I do believe that there are, those objective worlds are equally as real as our world, but not because our world is real, but because our world is fundamentally not real. Like I don't, of course, I believe in linear time, but I don't believe I've had experiences that just completely shatter the illusion of time in many different ways, personally, anecdotally, many different ways. So that's kind of my contention is that it's not that those realms are concrete, that you can go and visit there. But I feel like this isn't concrete either. And I don't mean that like, be don't forget, don't take care of your responsibilities, all of those things. There's a, there's a balancing act I think we are supposed to do here. But yeah, I don't know. I think it's a little more nebulous. I think this world is probably less real and less concrete. And that I think, I mean, this is your experience too. And so you would have insight into it too. But I think that that's accurate. In my experience, that seems accurate, that this world is probably more like a dream as opposed to the dream not being as real as this world, right? That's what I think. Yeah, but I would just go the opposite of that. Mm. That I would say that, again, in physical reality, there's continuity and coherence over time. And that's something that is not experienced within the psychedelic state or within the dream state, where things are constantly changing. Totally. That you can't keep going back to the same place there's no or experience the same thing. Right, right, right. Yeah. So that, yes, reality as we experience it as a, is an illusion, but I also say this is as real as it gets, okay? So For it's an this- illusion, but it's still real. And that what happens in the mind is of a lesser ontological level than mm. what happens at the physical level. So for mm. example, mm-hmm. um, if I win the lottery in a dream, because there's no continuity and coherency over time, that other than having a psychological and emotional effect on me, that's not gonna change my life. If I win the lottery out here in the real world, I'm gonna have a bunch of money to spend, and that's gonna change my experience. So the things that we experience in our dreams Yes, they affect us, but not at the same level of reality. Okay, I will say, in my experience, there is a clear energetic connection between the dream state and our and our reality. And money is a great example because I am, you know, blessed enough to have been invested in Bitcoin and gotten into cryptocurrency, truthfully, at the perfect time, and it has obliterated the concept of money for me. And I was someone who, before this happened, was experiencing acute tremendous financial turmoil, just bought a house, just had a kid. And I really was just feeling the effects of of financial responsibilities and, and racking up debt. And I view certain activities that I did involving prayer, um, unintentional dream work, but observing psychic phen- phenomenon non-judgmentally is having a profound impact on my actual later physical experiences. Now, energetically, we could say this emanated from the physical thing that was a projection outward into the dream state, and that just concretized kind of, you know, what my intention was in this reality. But that also, I think, sometimes disregards what could happen 
you know, with precognition or experiences of non-duality, whereas time doesn't, ex- where time just doesn't exist. That the balancing act for that, I think, is probably one of the hardest things to do. But as I've gotten further removed from my non-dual experience, extended non-dual experience, I think I get less and less convinced that this world is real without negative repercussions, without me getting untethered and, you know, we got to do whatever you want. It just certainly feels like this world is less concrete, whether this is a function of some omega point or whatever the hell people want to call it, or it's just a broader awareness of this kind of collectively rising in our society, because it's just, it's hard to admit we don't live in very psychedelic times, whether we partake or not, you know? Yeah. But the thing is, though, the physical world operates according to certain constraints that are not necessary in the dream state or in the psychedelic state. Totally. Um, so, so again, this is where we're dealing with ontological levels of reality. So, for example, when I dream and uh, every once in a while I remember that I'm dreaming and it's like, oh yeah, I can fly because I'm dreaming. I can't do that in physical reality. I have to get in an airplane. That there are certain right. rules of that, that allow physical reality to maintain itself as a coherent energetic structure through the ongoing flowing movement of now in a way that is not apparent within dreams or in the psychedelic state. And and while there is psychological and emotional transference between dreams and visions and our physical reality, again, if you're starving, you might dream of eating food and feeling satisfied. But when you wake up, you know what? you're still going to be starving. Or I'm going to use an even more personal example because this happens to me sometimes in the the wee hours of the morning. We're in my dream. It's like, damn, I really got to pee. And I keep finding, keep keep trying to find a place to pee in my dream. And then I'm feeling like, I just peed. Why do I still feel like I need to pee? Okay. And then I'm I'm looking everywhere. I got to find another bathroom. I got to pee. And then I'm peeing in my dream. It's like, fuck, I'm still not satisfied. And then I finally wake up and realize, I really need to urinate. Okay, no matter how many times I pee in my dream, that's not going to change the fact that I physically need totally. to pee. These are different orders of reality. I, and what happens in one is not necessarily going to satisfy what happens in the other. I agree with that. However, I will say that ontologically speaking, just because there are observable rules in this reality, in my mind, wouldn't give it precedence over any other worlds that maybe we're not aware of what those rules could be. That that's to me because I, I'm also using, you know, some historical and, you know, religious and contemplative science backgrounds here. You know, a lot of dream yoga that's done in Tibetan Buddhism, the function of those, there are operating rules for reality. There are in, you know, I'm not well versed in occult stuff at all, but there are clearly structures and rules to these things that seem to be independently observable. Um, sometimes with no pre-knowledge of what those would be. So it's not like I've been exposed to something and, oh, here are the rules now. So to me, I would need either some clear evidence that this is the highest order of reality relative to something else. And to me, I guess I'm kind of agnostic in the sense that I've been in other realities. Sometimes they bleed into this reality. And I'm not, I haven't seen enough evidence that I would say this is, this is the most concrete. That's that's kind of my stance on it. Well, I would then just challenge you is like, well, then find something more concrete and show us. Well, that's you know? what I would say. That's what I would say. I would say your direct experience of 5-MeO DMT is perhaps the most concrete level of reality. That's the foundation upon which all of this is built. Yes. Yes. That yes, would be I, my level of reality that I would say, okay, that's really the only real slash unreal thing, that void fullness. So to me, our constructs of who we are are just equally unreal, but by the same, on the same token, those other archetypal or whatever wor- worlds are just as real as, as well. Right. But it's what's unreal is our concept of ourselves. Right. Okay. So we are real, but it's what you think you are. That's where the problem lies. Okay. Cause that's, that's the ego that gets in and says, well, I'm this or I'm that, and this is this and this is that, and starts labeling and um, creating a sense of narrative for the personal self. But I mean, since you mentioned it, you know, it's important to understand that when we're talking about, say, like Tibetan Buddhism, they're quite clear that when they're talking about 
these intermediary states of consciousness, they are projections. They are not. Absolutely. They're not fundamental reality. They are projections. And that totally. the whole training process of Vajrayana Buddhism is, the mirror is, to, like is, is, is to use the projections to recognize that actually these are all just constructs of your own mind, which is actually the pure light of awareness. And so like once you get to Zogchen, the, the highest teachings, they leave all of that visionary stuff behind. Totally. And it's directly, direct entry into the non-dual state. So all of the dazzles and the bells and whistles and the lights and the machine elves, all of that is the play of the mind in misrecognition of itself. And then when, it, when you do recognize yourself, see, this is where we then go back to the experiential level that we can argue about it as much as we want or talk about it as much as we want at the verbal level. But when the experiential level actually opens up, the revelation is, oh, shit, it's all me. Oh, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what to think about that, you know? Absolutely. And so then it becomes a question of, so then what is the relationship between the absolute nature of reality and the, and the apparent right relative nature of reality that we exist in most of the time at this dualistic level. And here is where I find that the more attention that people pay to their visionary experiences, Agreed. either psychedelic or dream state or whatever, the less grounded in this reality they tend to be. Yes. And the more off the mark, and here again, this is a place where people really don't like me, but I like to use him because he's the perfect example that Terrence McKenna was so far off the mark yeah. about what he was talking about totally. with machine elves in 2012 that I use him as an example is that the more energy and attention you get to try to unravel the narrative of your psychedelic experience, the less grounded in actual reality you are. Because we must not forget that Terrence McKenna was serious when he said at the end of 2012, we will all step into UFOs made out of language and rejoin our intergalactic community. And this will be the omega point of human history. And he was wrong. Well, that's not it, an accurate description. No, and it's all based on a narrative created through his visionary experiences. That I believe. And I think that's really important to point out that <clears throat> the visionary experiences has take, if taken as gospel and not recognized. Like I said, I'm not saying, hey, you have this experience on a psychedelic. You see these realms. They're objectively real. That's more real than us. Certainly not saying that. I don't believe that. Um, I don't think it's true. I just think. And one thing I want to go back to Tibetan Buddhism is. If we're talking about all of that in that cosmology, we're firmly in the cyclical world of samsara. So we're put in maybe a unique position of awareness relative to these things. But this is also equally as illusory as, you know, anything related to demigods, the helm realm. So that's important, I think, because I think if we're saying that this reality is somehow... It's our reference point right now as humans, but who knows if we die and we're in that clear realm and before we reincarnate, we want to go to Buddha realms, whatever the hell it is, we may have a completely different conception of what this reality actually was. It, to me, and I, and I think I saw you say this in an interview with Reset Me, I, the overwhelming uh, kind of uh, feeling I get about this incarnation is one of gratitude. It seems acutely precious. It seems, and that I don't want to diminish that this this realm in some way is, oh, it's just like every other. It's not that important. You know, they're equally unreal. It certainly feels, and this maybe is our ego, but per perhaps not, very precious in terms of being able to even have these types of conversations and reflect on them. Whereas if you're in another one of these, let's say you do incarnate as an actual god, a lesser god, not the source. You're some in some realm as the Buddhists describe. And this is this is why I always ask this question to whoever I speak to, because I think it's somehow a lot of people don't take stances like you're taking. They don't take stances like I'm taking. It's just kind of an unresolved yeah. question whether these are objective things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we'll agree to disagree. And I certainly will give your your idea a lot of thought because I think there is there is validity and it's certainly experientially, it'd be hard for me to, you know, omit that this certainly seems like the ultimate reality. When I go to sleep and wake up every day, I'm here. Um, yeah. I just don't know if that's the end all given how weird life is. It just seems like it's not as, yeah. you know what I mean? Well, yeah. so 
this is one of the reasons why I've given the label onto my own view of radical non-dualism, that I 100% reject the notion of reincarnation. Uh, I say that that is 100% a fabrication of the ego because it maintains the idea that there is some individuality that is you that is reincarnating across multiple lifetimes. And my position is very firm on this. There is only God. There is one being that is pretending at this moment to be these two different people talking to each yes. other. But we are actually the same being. Agreed. So, so there is nothing that is you other than your distinct physicality. And mm. then mm. the identity that you have wrapped around that physicality that creates the impression that you are distinct from me. But there's only one. So there is no multiple incarnations across multiple lifetimes. There's only God. And therefore, there is no heaven. There's no hell. There's no afterlife. There's no intermediate realm. You see, there's the divine imagination, which can be experientially entered into and exited out of. Yeah. But in terms of actual incarnation, there is one being living all lives simultaneously. So another word that I would use for God is God is the multi-being. God is the individual being that is the multi-being that is all these things. And there aren't other realms that there is the mental space of the divine imagination. And we can interface with that and we can experience that. And it's a lot of fun. And sometimes it's scary and sometimes it's freaky and there's lots of weird stuff in there. And that it can be also insightful. It can be revelatory, but it's all just projections. But how the, are you that, not, those levels are all just projections? How are you not including this realm within that narrative there? They would it would it would seem that if that is one God, I believe what this what's so weird for me is speaking about non-dual, I a hundred percent agree with your conception of this interconnected being experiencing itself through divine imagination. That literally fits in with my viewpoint of the world. Where I don't agree is that I do believe in reincarnation for various reasons. Not that it's some actual like Noah's gonna reincarnate as this. However, if we're in this realm, that is a function of this realm that I think is possible. And I think there's enough objective proof that there is some linearity. However, again, it's kind of like we've agreed to play this game, this game of time and space. Within this game of time and space, all of these things are possible, but ultimately this game of time and space is just a game. That's kind of how I look at it. And that would necessarily include our human incarnation. So you could reincarnate as Jeff, as 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 Dave, but, as Linda. But, but then, but then, who who are you talking about when you're saying you could reincarnate? Who is that you you're talking it would, about? Oh, so the cosmology for me, the 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 hierarchy here would be the clear light that you experienced when you did five meo DMT. That is the we could put that at the bottom. That's the foundation of everything. From there, and I'm, I don't know this, we could imagine being the operative word here. We he her, whatever it is, would be able to have different cyclical realms of existence. Also realms outside of the cyclical existence. So these would be the Buddha realms, these heavens, these other places. None of these, just to be clear, are more real than that base level of reality. That's all that I think is. That's That to me is like, that's the end point. That's the layer of discussion. And I think that's ultimately where we agree. To me, anything stemming from that is equally real and unreal in the same way. That's I think that's basically where it is. So within that confine of you being Martin or me being Noah, if we're in this realm of cyclical existence, samsara, where these different things can happen, we could choose to reincarnate in this kind of game world over and over and over, and we would be ourselves in some weird way. And I think there's also a function of why we don't remember reincarnation in this game world is it would be horrible if we remembered every single previous existence and there wasn't some layer that was kind of blocking us. And I think people can access these things. Again, though, I'm not saying that, oh, well, this is reality and that people just reincarnate and the math adds up and this is how it is. It's just I do kind of agree that this is a delusion. It's not like a real actual thing. It's just this imaginative game that we're playing. But I don't make a distinction between any of the Bardo states, any of the other dimensions, realms or anything. And this one, 
you know, outside of, you know, specifics, but it's not like it's more real or unreal than the others. That's my, my yeah. point. And, and then that's just a place where I would fundamentally disagree yeah, that I, I love would, it. <laughs> and what for me, what it comes down to is when you really know yourself and when you're really honest with yourself, that this becomes apparent, this becomes clear because th- th- so this is what happened to me. Okay. So as I was going through my process, it was like, oh shit, maybe all this reincarnation stuff really is real. Maybe all these other realms really are real. And the resolution point that came for me was when it was, oh, that's not the case. It's just God. And that this physical world that we are living in, this is how God is playing itself out. And that these other realms are merely reflective states and that that this is, it's a game that we are then putting our own illusions onto. We are projecting those out into our image of ourselves and what we think of others. Um, but who is we? That, who is we there? Who's the operative we? Okay, so the we would be the ego. Okay. Then. But is the okay. ego real? Um, the ego is a mask. It's not, it's not your true identity. It's it's a character like persona. That the, yes, that the one multi-being is performing as. Okay. But I there's agree. nothing, there is nothing that is essentially Martin. There is nothing that Agreed. is essentially Noah. There is nothing that is essentially anyone. That it's this one being doing this. And that what it comes down to is that. Psychedelic. So this is what I really write about yeah, in yeah, yeah. my latest book, In Theogenic Liberation, is how to tell the difference between your natural energetic flow and structure and the energetic flow and structure of your ego and how you create the character for yourself. And that when you get clear on this in your physical embodiment, that then you can distinguish between where you are putting layers of illusion projection onto yourself and onto reality and when you're just being authentic. So one of the ways that I describe this is that energy is real. And it's about learning how to pay attention between what is my authentic energy versus what is not my authentic energy. And this is also a place where I highly encourage people to step back from speculation and wonder. That this is some this is a process of self observation. It's not about intellectually trying to figure things out. It's not about trying to parse things out into well, this is real, this is not real. It's about learning to tell the difference at an immediate energetic level between what is and what is not. What you are adding to the situation, uh, how you are interpreting the situation. And that the more time people spend speculating, the more time they're actually just generating mental energy for themselves and are not necessarily grounding themselves into the reality of of the moment of now. Because, of course, yes, time actually is an illusion, but we experience it now. And so it's about getting in touch with what is now, what is here, what is my true nature, and that then these intermediary realms that we're talking about, they lose their significance. Totally. Because I couldn't agree more. I could yeah. not agree more with that. I see this is something where when we're talking about it kind of ontologically or just trying to figure out where it fits in, I I found the same thing as you that once you kind of get it, like once you get it and and what's interesting is getting it can be different things for different people, but once you as a individual dual dualistically get it, you don't have the same types of questions. You're clear on what your perspective is. It fits into your experiences throughout your life. And what's beautiful is it can shift often. I mean, people find this when you're a kid, your experience of the world changes when you're a teenager, when you're an adult, when you're an old person. But I agree that the questions become less interesting or even just less useful in terms of like, what is this? Why is that happening? Why is this? It's just kind of like an inner sense of knowing. Um, I do absolutely agree with that. And I think that's really important because I think I notice a lot of people get caught up in that shit, especially psychonauts. Like they love to, they have this weird experience and they got to analyze it to death and extrapolate meaning. And just to be clear about McKenna, I, I love Terrence in so many different ways. And his brother is a, is a good friend, but I, he was, he, and he would be privately, I've heard many stories, the first to admit he was full of shit. 
all he was just talking. A lot of it was verbal diarrhea. He knew it. He also, you know, I've mentioned this on the podcast from from people who are very close to him. He did not do macro doses for the last 15, 20 years of his life. Yeah. He really yeah. wasn't doing it. And that's there's no shame in that. There's no nothing. But you have to fit that into some of the things he was saying. And it's cool. Terrence, if anything, gets your imagination going, which I think is a critically important thing. But if you interpret that as gospel, as this is actually objectively what's going on, and that's where I tend to agree with you. I, I want to be clear when I say that these things could potentially objectively exist somewhere. It's not like they're of a higher order. It's not like they're higher up in the magnitude. So those are the realms we should be looking at. I very much kind of relate this to what Carl Jung would say about exoticizing foreign cultures and countries. You don't want to get caught up in some other thing because that's the true source and disregard what's going on with you in the moment and now for you energetically to try to figure it out. So I I think that's I'm glad you mentioned that. And I, you know, it's unfortunate when people idolize pe someone and everyone's guilty of this at some level you know, and someone says something that doesn't fit in with their narrative or picture of them that they can get kind of testy about it. But um, I think there's a way to respect Terrence McKenna and also just vehemently disagree with a lot of things he said. It's not it's not that hard to do. I have friends. I don't agree with all the things they say. It's not that crazy. So, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's not I don't want to beat the dead horse or anything like that. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not quite sure where you're located. I'm in New um, York. I'm in New York. New York. OK, Upstate, so I don't yeah. know how. So I don't know how people were in New York, but I got to tell you over here on the West Coast, man, when it was coming up on 2012, it was it was treated like gospel. And everyone's like, yeah, it's coming, like it's coming and you know, and I was writing papers about how I think all of this is a bullshit narrative created by Terrence McKenna and other people who have bought into all this. And I got to tell you, I received hate mail. I had people like, just you wait and see, it's going to happen. Um, you know, and so, when, yeah, and, I mean, and, yeah. and then, and then after, after the big nothing, it's quite interesting that then people's approach to me shifted to like, well, he was an entertainer and, you know, he was well, inspiring and he me, was creative. Whereas before that people were really taking a lot of this stuff seriously. And, and something that I see in a lot of spiritual communities, um, is that they really take their visions seriously. They really take their um, dualistic experiences very, very seriously, and they use them to make excuses for themselves or to try and define themselves or create an... I mean, over here on the West Coast, I mean, I live in Ashland. Everybody wants to be a shaman or a healer or a priestess. or And so they create an image, what they do is that they take one ego and then they replace it with a whole Whoa. new set of ego structures and narratives. And then they use their dreams and their visions and their astrological sign to give themselves excuses for why they do the things they do. And, and all I'm trying to say ultimately is like, okay, that's fine if you want to do that, but none of that is necessary that you are the clear light of awareness. And if you want to focus on the razzle dazzle of the samsaric experience of being, that's fine. That's not actually bringing you closer to truth or to reality. And it's not actually helping you be here now and be authentic and true, which for me, that is the most important, that the more energy people put into their astral experiences, the less they tend to actually be here and the less capable they are of dealing with actual reality as it presents themselves because there's yeah. so much of an overlay of projection and identity and meaning. And so that I'm just trying to undermine all sense of yeah. meaning. Yes, yes. I mean, I can tell. And I, I think the middle ground for me there is sometimes the gap between what we considered or one would consider consensus reality and maybe what actually is going on is too big of a chasm for people to just be like, all right, fuck it, I'm jumping, we'll see where I end up. Especially if you've been kind of indoctrinated culturally or society in society to a certain way of being. And again, I see this happening with cryptocurrency and how everyone has a very strong relationship to money, whether they eschew it, love it, find its energetic purpose or whatever. Everyone has attachments, which just completely destroys people's paradigms. But, um, you know, it's not everyone's attachments to who they are as a person. I lost my train of thought. Hold on. Remind me what we're talking about. I don't know. Everything. You know, we Reality. Were, <laughs> we, no, we were, what were you just saying? 
so well, I, I can, that I was saying that the more energy that people put into their narratives of their astral yes, experiences and spiritual experiences, that the less grounded in reality they tend to be. A- and I agree with that at statement. A, at, at a personal individual level. I agree with that statement. I think for a lot of people though, that's a necessary, it's like if you remember when, at least for me, when I was in high school, a lot of my friends were skaters. I didn't give a shit about skateboarding, but that was the culture that my friends were in. So I put on the Jinko jeans. I got a skateboard. I fell on my ass a few times. I'm like, fuck it. I'm not doing this. I think that's kind of what's going on. I think there is a, and also I will disagree to some extent about 2012. I don't think it was a cataclysmic end times that we're getting into literal spaceships. I can mark in my life, um, maybe a self-fulfilling prophecy, a major energetic shift for the planet. And I know it sounds like woo-woo shit, and a lot of other people had had very pivotal experiences in their lives, whether it was a psychedelic experience or a shift in job or profession. So I do think there was kind of a energetic pivot that was experienced. It's not the literal kind of, you know, we're going to lay on the floor and drink Kool-Aid and go up to the mothership. But I do yeah. think this stuff actually happened. So what I'm saying is the function of something like this would be, let's, let's say in my diluted world that there was an energetic shift towards the beginning of the 2010s um, and people are feeling this and we're seeing this maybe in people this massive influx to yoga and shamanism and ayahuasca and all these things i think it's kind of like the tricycle for getting to 5meo dmt experiences so I, i i recognize that i listen one of my favorites is Chogyam Trungpa. Spiritual, you know, cutting through spiritual materialism is essential reading for anyone trying to find out who they are as a person, in my opinion, just because you will learn very quickly your ego, anyone's ego, will co opt fucking anything. 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 Mm. So it's important to be aware of that. But I also recognize, like, you know, the, the people are going to do what people are going to do. You know what I mean? Maybe people pretend to be in a certain type of music until they find the music that they actually like and is really who they yeah. are. That's kind yeah. of what I look at. I, I want to wrap this up, but I want to talk about your uh, conference uh, that is coming up and also um, you know, anything else you want to mention where people can find you. And I end with a few questions after that, but I want to give you a chance to, to let people know what you're up to. Okay. Um well, before I talk about the conference, I'll just really quickly mention my latest book, which I, I mentioned before, but I'll bring it up again, which is Entheogenic Liberation, Unraveling the Enigma of Non-Duality with 5-MeO-DMT Energetic Therapy. That's <laughs> the full title of the book. And the purpose of the book ultimately is to help people cut out the middleman, essentially, of how to enter directly into the fullness of what you are and then get straight on your embodied physical being and leaving out the middle stuff. Like I say right at the beginning of the book, this book is for serious self liberators. If this is, if you're reading this and you want to learn how to be a shaman and use psychedelics and work in the astral, this is not the book for you. If you want to learn how to ritualize your use of psychedelics, this is not for you. If you want to go all the way and figure this shit out and then live (laughs) that in your embodied everyday reality, this is the book. (laughs) <laughs> for you. So, so I'm very emphatic on trying to cut out the middleman because that's what I found happened for me. So I'm trying to share that with other people. And I that's also fair. emphasize that people have to do it for themselves, that that's the only possible way to get there. You, you can't get it just by reading the book. You have to engage with the methodologies that are written about in the book. You have to approach your experiences with a certain level of understanding and openness in order to really work through it. And that I do think it's possible for people to do that. Um, so I just kind of wanted to wrap up yeah, that for, yeah, portion no, of the I, section that's with, awesome. with, with that. Um, it's definitely my most popular book that I've written. Um, Being Human would be second to that, which I wrote in 2009. But this is the expansion and continuation of, of what I really got started in Being Human. And um, you know, a, a lot of people... It's interesting because I do hear from a lot of people who tell me that well, when I started reading your book, I was really angry <laughs> yeah, because you were telling me that all these things that I really took seriously are not so serious. And then they say, by the time I got to the end, I was just like, damn, this guy's just telling me the truth. Fuck. The truth is What good. do I do with that? Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, just to plug the Exploring Psychedelics Conference. So um, five years ago now, I started here in uh, Ashland, Oregon at Southern Oregon University. It was actually another professor at the university um, sent out an email saying, hey, 
anybody want to help me put on a psychedelic conference? That there was a few other professors that he like targeted <laughs> at the university that he knew might be interested. I was the only one who responded. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. And <laughs> by that point, so I have my Entheogenic Evolution podcast. I've been running that for a number of years at that point, for about five years. So I said, oh, yeah, well, I've got people from my podcast and we could bring them in and it'll be great. Totally. Um, and now at this point, we're in our fifth year and uh, the other professor has backed out. So he's not really involved in it anymore. And that's for the past couple of years, um, just for job yeah, yeah. you know re requirements or whatnot it's not that he decided he disapproves in any way <laughs> it's just he's not able to commit himself because it's a great deal of work so life now happens yeah yeah life happens so the, this is our fifth year of doing this um and it's going to be may 24th and 25th which is thursday and friday at southern oregon university here in ashland and that's followed by an after party on friday night um where uh, my wife and I will be performing music. We've got some other people playing as well. And then on the Saturday after that, which is May 26th, we have an all-day um, psychedelic documentary film fest where we're going to be watching a few different documentaries and then also having some pr presentations and responses that are, are part of that as well. Um, overall, there's about 35 different people presenting. Awesome. Um, covering a wide range of topics that the that, that, the conference itself is called Exploring Psychedelics, and the subtitle is In Culture, Science, and Religion. So I tried to take a really broad perspective of what are people doing culturally, what is the science, awesome. how has this been used historically or in contemporary religions, and really try and keep it broad. Like some conferences like everybody to be a scientist yeah, yeah, I or think a that's PhD, awesome. and I like to mix it up. Um, so awesome. we have everything from enthusiasts to practitioners to neuroscientists to religious studies scholars um, to theologians. I mean, there's, it's a real big mix of people that participate. I also like to promote that it's the only conference, the only psychedelics conference in North America that I am personally aware of that is offered for free. There is no ticket required for this conference. And I like to point out that many of these conferences charge you upwards of a hundred to 200, $300 to register and go to the conference. This one is for free. I do ask for donations. Um, anybody who's interested, the, uh, web page is www.exploring-psychedelics.org. And you can check out the lineup that we have for this year. So right. coming up just a, uh, just about three weeks from today is when the conference awesome. is, and it's, it's the largest such conference in the entire Northwest of the United States That's that awesome. there's, there's, there's nothing comparable that happens in. So I'm excited to be doing the fifth year. It's a hell of a lot of work on my part. <laughs> yeah, it um, seems like it would which be. I do, which, because I am the only person, I'm the sole person organizing this whole thing. I don't get paid any money for doing any of this. It's many, 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 many hours of volunteer work essentially by me. But I, I do it because I love it. And it's a great excuse for me to get a large group of people together that I can then put on a concert later and play <laughs> music, which is one of my, my personal... I love it loves in this world is making and performing and sharing music with people. So that gives me an excuse to put on a gig and then, you know, two, th 300 people will show up, which otherwise doesn't ever happen for me. So I kind of joke and I'm also serious that, um, for me personally, what do I get out of the conference? I get to put on a conference and a concert and have a bunch of people come and enjoy themselves. That's and for awesome, me man. personally, that's, that's what I really enjoy. But I also love allowing a variety of perspectives. I mean, like if you were to ask me, sit down and ask me, okay, out of all these presentations that just happened in this conference, which, where do you agree and where you disagree? Oh yeah. There'd be a lot, there'd be a lot of stuff in there. I say, well, I don't agree with I love what, that. you know, but I want everyone to feel that they have a voice and I want people to feel that they don't need to be quote unquote an expert. Um, but I also want the experts to be there as well. Yeah. And so that it's, I kind of call it the people's psychedelic conference because it's free anyone can can attend and i'm open to receiving submissions from anyone and like to keep it a nice mix and also when possible give voice to minorities um who are not well represented in the contemporary psychedelic movement and also to women that you know you see a lot of these conferences they're dominated by men a lot of the biggest names in psychedelics are men women have just as much to contribute okay. and their voices have not been given as many opportunities so for example on thursday 
I have a, a variety of women presenting, and then there's going to be um, a women's panel presentation. And then the big topic on Friday is 5-MeO DMT, and we have a variety of different perspectives being presented there, and then also um, a panel presentation on that. Um, so I like to keep it diverse and keep it fun. And uh, yeah, it's coming up in three weeks. So I can't wait till it's done because then yeah, I can man. relax. Again. Yeah, I know how <laughs> those types of things go, having put on a few events. And I think getting the multiple perspectival view, multi-perspectival view is just so important. There's a lot of things you say that I, I really don't disagree with many things, but I also like that you like hearing different opinions too. So now I'm going to ask you three quick questions and then one okay. open-ended one uh, may seem silly, but they're not. What is your favorite color? Um, I definitely gravitate towards uh, blue greens, turquoises, uh, such as that. Um, just I love that as a color. I'm really fond of all colors. Um, but if we're really talking at like the personal egoic level, that my eyes look prettiest with a, a nice blue green. <laughs> you and me both, my color. friend. Yeah. What is your favorite number? Um, I, I guess I have three. It would be one, um, infinity, which is not really a number, and then thirteen, just Ooh. because um, I like to be provocative and annoying to people, and I know that people are superstitious about the number thirteen. So that's just an immediate answer there. Thirteen is my favorite number. Um. What is oh, your, we're so alike. <laughs> what is your favorite animal? Uh, well, human beings. Um, that counts. You could say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, but manta rays are really damn cool. I mean, I just I like I like the look of a manta ray and the sleekness and just the whole shape and form I find very satisfying, but yeah, I mean, oh, I'm not. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not really that good with favorites because I know. I you, you know, think I, I've done so many. You think you're the only one who has trouble with these? I get it, but <laughs> I I got them out of you. That's the important thing. Last yeah. question: What's a practical tip that you could share with people listening that's helped you in your life? Take some really strong psychedelics, <laughs> and then just give yourself the challenge of going through the whole experience by doing nothing, staying present, and remain symmetrical in your body. That's my challenge. And that's, that's really my good. advice. That's, that's really my advice. One. And I got to tell you, it is extraordinarily difficult for most people. <laughs> yeah, no shit. That's and not... this, this is one of the fundamental points that I bring up in both being human and everything I've written since then, and especially in theogenic liberation. That if you really want to figure out how your ego is running you in your body, in your life, and in your mind, and in your heart, you must explore symmetry in your body and it, then find all the ways that your ego is going to try and pull you out. And once you get really clear on that, then the distinction between the ego and what's really going on becomes obvious. And that's where you find your point of clarity. So that's my advice. I love it. Martin, thank you so much for doing this. This is a lot of fun. We'll do it again. Yeah, well, thank you for the invitation and having me on. It's been a month or two since anybody's interviewed me. So I was kind of like, hmm, <laughs> wonder when the next interview is coming along. And I got your email. I was like, oh, yay, there it is. It's a synchronicity. Um, so I, as you can tell, I love the opportunity to share and talk. And I can just ramble on pretty I much love it, forever. Man endlessly dude i love um, it i love it yeah so thanks for the opportunity Appreciate yeah man it. i'll let you know when this is out and thanks have a good one man all right, all right take peace. it easy Bye. thanks for listening to that episode uh there was some weird microphone stuff going on in the intro the little skippy skippy so sorry about that sometimes it happens i don't know why if you want to go check out more of Martin, go to his website, martinball.net. If you want to check out more of me, well, I don't know. There's syncpodcast.com. There's CryptoSync. There's all these different things you can do. Uh, just have a great day. Have a great weekend. Have a great life. I will see you next week.